In this video, we are going to learn how to find absolute extrema on a given interval. And so the first thing that we have to do when we are given the function is we have to find its first derivative. So in this case, the derivative of negative 8x squared would become a negative 16x plus the derivative of 96x would just be 96 and then the derivative of negative 5 would be 0. Now, we want to set our first derivative equal to 0 so that we can find our critical numbers. So if a negative 16x plus 96 is equal to 0, I would probably move the 16x over just to make it positive, but it's okay if you want to move the 96. And so in this case, when I divide both sides by 16, I'm going to get a critical number of x equals 6. Now, the difference with this and what we've been doing before is they give us an actual interval that we're going to have to look at because your absolute maximum is going to be the highest uh, point, the point with the highest y value on that interval, and your absolute minimum has to be the point with the absolute lowest y value on the interval. So we've got to see what's going on around these x's. So the critical value is at 6, and then... The smallest x value that we can have is over here at negative 7. So that is the smallest. I'll kind of do it like that. The largest x value that we can have is at positive 7. Okay, so that'll be like that. Now, let's see what's going on with our using our first derivative test. So if I plug in something that is smaller than 6, probably 0 would be the easiest. Um, if you plug in negative 16 times 0 plus 96, you're going to get a positive 96. So what we know is the first derivative is increasing on that particular interval. So we're going up. And then if I plug in um, something to the right of 6, um, obviously 7 would be to the right of 6, so we can look at that just to see what's happening on that particular interval. So if I take a negative 16 times 7, and then I add 96. My negative 16 times 7 is going to give me a negative 112. And then when I add 96, I'm left with a negative 16. And so what matters is the fact that it's negative on that interval, so that tells us that the function is actually decreasing. So as we talked before, you have relative maximums that are going to occur when a graph goes from increasing to decreasing. So we know that uh, we've got a relative maximum that will occur there, and um, it'll actually become your absolute maximum because it will have to be the highest point on the graph based on the increasing and the decreasing. So we will need to find an actual y value that goes with that. So we know the x value is 6. We'll need to figure out the y value. And then um, we've got to figure out which one's going to have the lowest y value on our graph. And so um, since the graph is, it's starting from a low point and going to a high, we're going to have to consider what is the y value at negative 7. And then over here on the right, because it's going from a high to low, we're going to have to look at positive 7 so that we can decide out of those two which one is the absolute lowest on the graph. So going back to my original function, and you know this part you can actually do with a calculator if you want. If you plug 6 into your original function, you're going to get a negative 8 times 6 squared plus 96 times 6 minus 5. And so um, that's where I'd actually hop on a calculator. And if I plug that in, I'm left with a y value of 283. So that is my absolute maximum. All right, and then I want to plug in my endpoints of my interval. So if I plug in a negative 7, I've got a negative 8 times negative 7 squared plus a 96 times a negative 7 and then minus 5. And again, you can do that particular number crunching on a calculator. So I get a y value of negative 1,069. 
And then finally, if I plug in my right endpoint of positive 7, I'm going to have a negative 8 times positive 7 squared plus 96 times positive 7 minus 5. And that is going to give me a value of 275. And so when we're talking about which y value is lowest on the graph, negative 1,069 is much lower than a positive 275. So your absolute minimum occurs at your left side of your endpoint of your interval, and it has a y value of negative 1,069. Okay, so now we have a new function. We're considering the function x squared minus 1 raised to the fifth power, and we're looking at that on the interval from negative 2 to 9. So again, we'll start with our first derivative. We've got to do the chain rule here. So we'll pull the power to the front, leave the inside alone, decrease the power by 1, so that's going to make it a negative 4 fifths, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which becomes a 2x. And so in this case, we have a 2x divided by 5, and then because of that being a negative power, that would be like having a fifth root of an x squared minus 1 to the fourth in the bottom of a fraction. So notice negative powers put terms in the bottom of a fraction. When it's a rational power, the the number on bottom is the actual root, so that's why the 5 went here. The number on top is the actual power of that particular expression. So if we actually set this first derivative, so 2x over 5 times the fifth root of x squared minus 1 to the fourth, if we actually set that equal to 0, Remember that the only way a fraction can equal 0 is when your numerator is 0. So if 2x is equal to 0 and I divide both sides by 2, my critical number is going to be 0. Other values that um, can make my, that can become critical numbers are going to be um, values that could make the denominator actually equal to 0. And so if I took that uh, denominator, the fifth root of x squared minus 1 to the fourth power. The only way that's going to equal 0 is if you actually have your x squared minus 1 equal to 0. And so that would tell you that x squared is equal to 1, and I could square root both sides. And so then x would be plus or minus 1. And uh, what we have to say is that they have to be part of the original domain, which when I look at my original function, they are. So those are also other potential critical numbers. So we've got a lot of things going on here. So first of all, the interval that we are looking at on our number line is from uh, x value of negative 2 all the way up to an x value of positive 9. And then we have our critical numbers at 0, and then we have positive 1, and we have negative 1. So we're going to use a first derivative test now so that we can see increasing and decreasing. So if I plug in something that is uh, to the left of negative 1, I'm just going to use the negative 2, the endpoint. So I'm plugging it into my first derivative, which says I'm going to have a 2 times my negative 2, and that'll be divided by a 5 times the fifth root of a negative 2 squared minus 1 raised to a fourth power. And again, it's not so much the value that I'm interested in. It's mainly do I have a positive or do I have a negative number. So obviously you get a negative 4 on top, and then on the bottom you're going to have a fifth root of a 3 to the 4th power, so that's positive. So negative divided by positive overall will leave you with a negative number on this integral. That's what matters. We don't care what the actual value is. What matters is that we know because the first derivative test says it's negative, the graph is decreasing on that interval. 
Now, we need to plug something in between negative 1 and 0, so we don't like to use fractions, but in this case, we're going to have to. And you can use your calculator when you're doing this number crunching like this. So if I put in uh, negative 1 half, then um, I'm going to have a 2 times my negative 1 half on top. And then on the bottom, I'm going to have a 5 times a fifth root of my negative 1 half squared minus 1 to the fourth. Notice no matter what we do down here on the bottom, when we raise it to the fourth power, that's always going to be a positive number. So really our sign is being determined by the top. 2 times negative 1 half is negative. Negative divided by positive, once again, is a negative. So the graph is also decreasing on this interval. So now as we move to the right of 0, when I plug in positive a half, Again, you can think of that, um, what I've already written here. So 2 times positive a half, if we put that right there, is going to give you a positive on top. And then again, as we already said, anything, when you subtract 1 and raise it to the fourth power, makes it positive. So positive divided by positive becomes positive there. So the graph is increasing there. And then finally... Um, something to the right of 1. You could use 9 if you want. I like to plug in smaller values, so I would probably just plug in a 2. So 2 times 2 on top, and then on bottom, we get a 5 times the fifth root of a 2 squared minus 1 to the fourth power. So again, positive divided by positive is positive. So this graph is continuing to increase here. So the, where we change from decreasing to increasing is right here at zero. And so we know that when it does that, we get a, a minimum. So we know that that's going to be the absolute minimum based on the fact that this graph is going down to zero and then back up on this particular interval. So we will need to know what our y value is when x is zero for our original function. Okay, so I know we'll have to find that y value there. And then for the maximum, we don't have a place where we're going from increasing to decreasing, but we do have these two endpoints. So we're going to have to look at the negative 2 as well as the positive 9 and see which of those would have the highest point on my graph. So if I come back to the original, let me start with my 0 first. The f of 0 would be... 0 squared minus 1 to the 1 fifth power. So 0 squared minus 1 would give you a negative 1. And if we take the fifth root of a negative 1, we get a value of negative 1. So that would be my absolute minimum on my graph. All right, if I plug in a negative 2 into my function, since it's the left endpoint of my interval, then I'm going to have a negative 2 squared minus 1 raised to the 1 fifth power. So negative 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 1 would leave me with 3. So uh, the fifth root of 3, I would have to actually get on a calculator to do that. You can either go 5 to the power of 1 third, or you can do, if you've got a, a, any nth root button, you could do that. And in terms of decimals, they want three decimal places. So I'm getting a 1.710 for that one. And then if I plug in my right side endpoint, which is the 9, I would have a 9 squared minus 1 to the 1 fifth power. So 9 squared is 81. Minus 1 would leave me with 80. And if I raise 80 to the 1 fifth power... I get a decimal of 2.402. So when we're talking about a maximum, we want the biggest. So 2.402 is bigger than 1.710. So I would say in this case, my absolute maximum is 9, 2.402.